You know, I was thinking a while ago, what a simple thing it is just to be a carpet cleaner. <laughs> just a friendly carpet cleaner. You see, you just don't have to know too much, you know that? Is it to have a lot of time to listen to Jesus, to love Jesus? And we got such a way that when the Lord in some small way wants to manifest himself through some man, that how we, uh, you know, you just hear a lot of words, you know that? And then you don't hear the word. <laughs> I was sitting over there last night, and the Lord just been dealing my life, and I'm just so convicted and so blessed. <laughs> don't understand me. <laughs> and the man brought in a little wine over there in the door. And he signaled me, come over, so he knew what my part was. And I went over there, and and I could just see me, and I could just see Grace, and I just took him and just held him, and boy, this dynamo started. Just loving. And then all you have to say is just boo devil. <laughs> it's all him. We just try to, well, I just try to help him out and get in strife and just love him. And when he gets busy, I don't hear him. See, I remembered that the Lord just reminded me, he has to remind you, you get where you're something. He reminded me when I was in Detroit, walking through a basement of a building with another wino. And I know we'd push the cobwebs out of the way But on drugs, being destroyed by the powers of darkness. And he fed me chicken wing and neck soup. I guess for now you know whose image we're working on. I want to share a testimony of grace. And I used to wouldn't share. I used to start my testimony and just want to say because I felt like it gave so much glory to the devil. But the Lord has showed me in his grace I can start with the powers, I can start with darkness, and brother I can end in the light. And so I'll start in the darkness. In the 1940s, there was articles in the Life magazine and Collier's magazine about a little town in East Tennessee where I was raised up at. And this town was just killings and wars and everything just political and of that nature. And there are four, four strongholds. There is darkness and forms of darkness, but I can tell you at that particular time, it was outer darkness. I have never witnessed or seen since I was a child what I saw happen there. I have seen families and in-laws just come together, just cutting each other with knives, whole families, when I was just a little boy. And that's the kind of thing that I saw and grew up in. When uh, I was five years old, my father was a chief deputy of a political system there in this county. I live next door to the jail. And as five years old, I was just 
They had a lot of fun with me. I was uh, locked up in the bullpen with other prisoners and left there. I was given a nickel to go curse people at times. I was given a nickel to expose myself. I was even given a nickel sometimes to be whipped. I picked cigarette butts up off the street and smoked them when I was five years old. I had little friends in this small town, which is a county seat, and we were, the men would stand around us and make us fight just like he would a couple of dogs. I know this one little friend that I had was called Joe Lewis, actually the boxer. And I sure didn't want to do that because it wasn't in my heart to hurt. And I started to school and I knew in the first two or three grades that I was a little quicker than some of the others. By God's grace, I, I know I was. But an interesting thing happened. I began getting slower, and they became weaker, I was quicker. The powers of darkness was moving into my life and controlling my life through the environment that I was in. I was so rejected and so confused. I couldn't even function in school. I couldn't even study. I never got out of high school, and that's something, I, of course, I'm not boasting about. I was in terrible bondage. That is the darkness I'm talking to you about. I would go around with such a tender heart. And uh, I le later learned that I had to hide the things that was in my heart because I would, could relate to hurting people, hurting kids, and I would find them. And I would just champion them and, and, and lo love them. And something would just, I tell you, I just went to give. I, I just didn't want anything. This is just, I just wanted to give and no one could understand what was happening to me to want to give everything I had away. Now, that's the interesting thing. What the powers of darkness wants to do to a tender heart, a tender heart can hear God, you know. And I'm sure the enemy will recognize things like this, but God's grace, he'd give me a tender heart. And so I would do things like go into the drugstore, and I would see, I would see back in these days, you know, the ladies would uh, carry change in a handkerchief. And uh, I'd see the mask for something that we only had the one drugstore, which was a bus stop. And I would watch them go up and ask how much something costs, maybe a Coca-Cola cookies or something, then watch them turn around and pull, untie their little handkerchief and look at there, they change and, uh, and count them out to see that if they could get this Coca-Cola or something, then it would just turn my heart absolutely out of them. And I'd watch the men, you know, with their little pocketbooks do the same thing. And I would just have to leave there. My heart would just break and I would have to hide this because the whole system was programming me to be tough, that I had to be tough, see. And, and I couldn't understand it. I, I, I had to just get away from it, to not let them see because this was considered a weakness in this system to have compassion and love. As a little boy, we had a little quartet and uh, we would go around the town, and this is very significant that we would sing to, uh, in a barber shop, maybe in a courthouse, and sometimes they'd give us a nickel or a dime or something. I remember the ones that's in this little quartet I was in, there was uh, Doris Kincaid, who is his, Doris, his, uh, who, who was a little boy, I tell you, they called Joe Lewis, because he was a boxer. And then there was uh, Dennis, and then there's Billy. Now Dennis was a thief. He died a thief. And Doris stole a car later on and he's coming over a hill between Benton and Etowah, Tennessee and run head on to another family and killed himself in a family of five. And my friend Billy, who I love so much, Billy finally got a law degree. Billy was an alcoholic. Billy's in darkness and Billy's in bondage too. And I recall the last time I saw Billy, the Lord had just saved me. I remember that I walked outside the house and I looked and there came Billy driving by the street. 
And I watched Billy look out the window at me, and I knew he wanted to stop. And I can think back now, and I know that the powers of darkness, the enemy just sent him on to where I couldn't tell Billy what had happened to me. It wasn't but a few days later that Billy, who was an alcoholic, was arrested and drowned in his own vomit in a jail cell. The pressures and everything that would come, and just in my own home life, I'd get around my father, my knees would actually knock. Everyone in town was afraid of him. I would tremble, even to walk in a room where he was at times. The pressures on me became so great that when I was about 15 years old, I finally had to, I just left home. I just had to get away from it. I left home, and I missed my mother, and I really missed my dad, too. And I, 15-year-old boy, just couldn't do too much. But finally, I, I came back and they met ever. Uh, they, they met me and my family did and got me to take me out of town and hide me from my father for a period of four months because he was going to kill me. Uh, and during this time that there was a, supposedly a reconciliation made with my father that I could come back. I could come back home. And I recall that I was so afraid and that my knees knocked as I came back there to face my dad, they walked in the house, and I walked around the house, and as I came to the kitchen, I heard my dad tell my mother and my brother that he was going to kill me. And it was a day or two later that the pressures were so great that I walked out in my yard. And I got down on my knees, and I had such a problem talking to the Lord because every time I'd think of Jesus or try to think of Jesus, curse words would come into my mind. And I was so often used to, I would, no one ever knew this, I would just take my hair and pull my hair and everything and I'd, try, I'd go running and everything because I couldn't think about Jesus. Every time I'd think curse words and I thought that was me. I always thought that was me. But anyway, I said, God, I just can't stand anymore. God, please make him die. Please make my father die. It was less than a week that my father had a heart attack and died. And I can't tell you how consumed I became in guilt and condemnation. And he buried my dad and I would go secretly. I would go to the graveyard and there the powers of darkness had me. And there they were just building on that, already that brokenness and just a terror to steal, to kill, to tear down. I sit there and I would weep over my dad's grave. Why couldn't I ever know you? I've had dreams through, throughout even my 40 years of dream after dream how I'd do something that would please my father. And that I never really got to know him. I never really got to understand the man. I never knew him. I didn't even know myself. I was in bondage. I was a prisoner. And then this guilt and condemnation followed me everywhere I went. When I was 17, I couldn't function in school. I might as well leave. I could get in the service when I was 17 years old. And I left to join the Air Force. And I just, uh, I, I came to the Lackland Field in Texas. This was back in the 40s. And, uh, and I was what you would call, what today they would they would refer to as very rural or very slow. I just, I mean, it's an amazing thing as I think back that, that they even, even let me. I was emotionally stunned. I was a, a, a prisoner. And, but anyway, during this time, as the enemy was just tearing down the tenderness and the tender heart that the grace of God has given me, he was beating and destroying something I didn't understand. Because, see, I went to church as a small boy, and the only thing I remembered is when the deacon wanted to take the pastor down in the, and, 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 in the basement and fight. And, and I didn't learn. I didn't even know until I was 43 years old or understood anything. I didn't understand about Jesus. I did not learn one thing. I did not learn one thing. And now, I went into the service. I was there, and it was, we would have the little training for the guard duty. I know that during this training that I was in front of a PX, and I simply just stepped from this guard post to go in there and to get a candy bar, a Coke, I don't remember. And I walked out and later on, it's just such a simple thing. And uh, I shouldn't have done it, but 
Nevertheless, someone did tell on me. And, it was, and, and that evening at night, I remember that these, these men uh, had, uh, had me in this room and they made me believe that they were going to put me in front of a firing squad that night. And I know that the trembling and the fear, and I really believe them, I believe this is my last night. This is it. I mean, I've heard of things like this, and I really didn't know. And they knew I didn't know because they were enjoying what they was watching there. Uh, and, and so, and this went on, and then I would leave the room. They would bring me back in, and they would go through the thing all over again. And finally, late that night, they told me to go on with the barracks. I couldn't believe that they just let me go to go to my barracks. Here I'm, I'm waiting to be killed, trembling in fear. And here they were telling me, they were telling me to, uh, that I could go back to my barracks. And then I realized that they had just toyed with me. And then the enemy just put the thoughts and the hostility and the hate and the murder to tear and come against, to, to tear down. That's the only weapons. I didn't know the weapons of Jesus. I was receiving in my mind the weapons of the devil to come against these people who had toyed with me and everything. And he built this hostility up in me. I didn't want to drink. And finally I came to a place where I decided there might be some kind of escape because of the torment that was in. And then when I started drinking, I did start drinking. And such hostility is in me. It came out. I come back and turn, turning over beds and everything throughout the barracks. Uh, it was later, later on that uh, drinking and driving over in Japan where I was there at uh, the occupation of Japan. I was just driving along. I was drinking. And then uh, the, as I get even with a little five-year-old boy, he just jerks loose from his mother. And then I can, I can hear the sound right now of this vehicle I was driving, hitting and killing a little five-year-old boy. And there was just no end to it. There was just no end to it. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. There's no way to me explain to you the hours and the time that I look at this little five-year-old boy and look at myself. I literally despise myself and everything about myself. And uh, as I he, the enemy just continued to tear down and destroy everything in my life. I come out of the service. I knew I was. A, I knew terrible things were wrong with me. I thought I had already seen the church, and I the world was telling me, and they already had me programmed to hang in there, hang in there. Keep a stiff upper lip. Hang on you. What they're telling you, hang on to pride. Pride. And I was hanging on there. And I was keep, keeping a stiff upper lip. And there was just not much left of me. As the drinking continued, and as I would, I would, uh, I began, I learned about drugs. A man who owned a, tr a truck stop dropped some in my coffee and then asked me later on how I felt. And boy, I tell you what, that was a new escape. And then there, right before this thing was even popular, and there became something else, an escape. I decided as my throat's in my mind, if I just live five years, five more years, if that's the extent of my life, it beat the torment to live another day or anything like I'd been living before. So I found it in drugs rather than it in Jesus. And so as my life continued to, to, to spiral downward and downward and into the pits of darkness, I came to a place I wanted to kill myself. I couldn't live anymore. I didn't want to live. And I remember in the loop in Chicago, I crawled up on a, I went up through the exits and everything to get up on top of a 60-story building. I was a steel rigger at the time. I liked being a steel rigger because I could move and I could run. My average change of residence was every six months. I never stayed in any place in the time I was 17 until I was 43 years, more than average of six months. I always had to keep moving. I had to keep running. I had to keep going. And I remember I got on this building and this, and, and drugs and all, and I leaned over that I'm going that I'm going to go off of this building. And I leaned way over and I decided, just one thought, and I can go ahead and jump. Just one thought, come, uh, come on. If that thought had come on, I'll end all this right now. As I leaned over this, but well, I think back, I could not, I could not. All I could do is just lean over and, 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 and just that little push, just that little help to where I could go on, I couldn't get it. So finally I decided, you know, I'll just run around the coping of this building and I'll just stumble and I'll fall off of it and trip. And I did run around, and I didn't stumble, and I didn't, obviously, fall off the building. And I left, and I would go to bridges, different times, always alone, and, and, and to lean over the bridge. Maybe this is the time that I, can, that I can end all of this. I remember going through and crossing rivers in freezing weather. I remember one particular time just running, and everything was after me. 
and just running and crossing rivers in freezing rain. I mean, uh, freezing weather, rather, and, and, and coming out. And, you know, finally, I remember one time I got to a, to a highway and I put matches in, my, in, in, in a hat there and everything, and I lit up grass and I literally just burnt the shoes off my feet because it's so cold and so, so drugged up. And so, I began to think about my life and my brother came to get me, I think at the time I was in Detroit, and he came to get me in a recall as he was taking me to Ohio, that when we'd pass under the bridges and everything, I would hide down in the floorboard of the car because I figured that people would be on the bridges, they were trying to get me, they were after me, they were trying to get me and to see me, and they wouldn't see me in the car, and I'd hide, and, 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 and of course, they, uh, I went to a mental institution. You know what we tell folks like that? Jesus can't help you. <laughs> Go to the nut house. Or if you get bad enough, they got a jail for you. The world does. Well, of course, I really wasn't thinking about Jesus. I thought I'd already knew about that. Folks that I saw couldn't even help themselves. How could they ever handle something like me? But I did. I went there so hurty. I can't tell you, folks. I can't tell you what I see. In a little while, I know. I can come to anyone that when I have the, when the Lord's grace is in my life, that I can't see some part of my life. And anybody, that hurting person can understand somebody else is hurting. It's, that's hurting. And brother, I know it. And so, the Lord in his grace. I went to this Everything is in my life. I begin sharing and relating. I was told to just tell it all to this psychologist in this mental hospital. It's a veterans hospital. It's a mental part where they dealt with the psychology. And then I did. I told him intimate things that I have never related to anyone in my life. And this went on for six months. At the end of six months, I came to a place there where finally, this is the day I get the answer. This is the day I sit across from a desk. And I have the answers to why I'm so different to all the torment and all the bondage. I sit across the desk from this psychologist and quite naturally I had leaned over because I put everything I had into it that six months and I was wondering if I'd left anything out. And here's the way he started out to me and he knew I was eager and anxious for the answers. And he said, Milk, when you first came here, and you started relating to some of the things to me about your personal life. I tell you what, I believed you was lying. I'm going to be honest with you, Milk. And I bothered to call and check in your part of the country with the things that you've been relating and sharing with me and I found out they were true. I'm waiting for the answer. And I leaned over and he said, Milk, what you need is a religious experience. And I, I was thinking religious spirit. I was thinking God. And he said, but you can't have one. The only answer he was for me, and right then he, I couldn't have it. Because he said, you can't have faith. I was talking to the powers of darkness. But he spoke a curse on me because I received that in my heart. I received those words in my heart and I believed that even God couldn't help me. And bad matters became worse. And then the hostility and everything that was there and had been there began to come out in a form of looking for bullies and things like that. And the people had always hurt other people and everything because I couldn't see the invisible powers of darkness behind all these circumstances that had involved my life. Quite naturally, bad matters became worse and I was in another mental institution there for several months. I left there in my life continually, got worse and more bondage. I even got to Atlanta, Georgia, and I I'm telling you, when you become a robot and when you belong to the devil, you act like the devil. You're the image and likeness of him, and I want you to tell you that he had my life. He totally had my life, slot, struck, and barrel, and I was being destroyed by the minute. And in Atlanta, Georgia, I'll not go into detail, I couldn't even stay in Atlanta, Georgia because of the trouble and everything that I was in in Atlanta, Georgia. And I left Atlanta, Georgia and went to Blue Ridge, Georgia and I was on a lake and I remember I was spending some time with myself and I walked through the woods and I'm thinking about here for, for 
I was in the, over 40 years old, and that I look back at my life, and, and, and I look at this world, and I say, you know, I didn't know anything about God, but I knew this world was phony as a $3 bill. I'm telling you when I was sick and tired of these world roles that I was playing that, that hang in there and keep a stiff upper lip and everything and I started looking at the roles that, the, that this world all but everybody's playing a role. Everybody's acting and everyone is playing. And you know and everything I think and I thought they've got to be some purpose. Something's made me. Someone has put me here. And I got to thinking if all there is for me to live this life and then die I'd been better off never to be born. They've got to be some kind of purpose in my life. Immediately I think of God, and when I think of God, I think about the people in church. And in the Lord, I just got my mind past them long enough to say, God, God. And I've never asked anything more serious in my life. I said, God, if you're real, please show me. And I, I, as ignorant as I was, the only thing I knew to do is just look for a tree to move or a light to flash. That's the only thing I knew. And I know I looked, and I, I didn't want to miss it. I was alone. There was no one watching me. And I, I, boy, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss that light or the tree move or something like that because that's what I was going, the way I was looking for him. But I called on God. I'd been involved already in two broken marriages. I crippled everything I ever got around. Why not? I was crippled. And then a girl that I'd met years before, my wife Joyce, Joyce and I came together and I know that the Lord was in this. But you know, I wanted to talk to I wasn't around anybody who talked to God, the Lord, about God about. But you know, I knew she taught Sunday school. Of course, at the time, I didn't know she's a lost Sunday school teacher. But anyway, I could talk to her and I remember that when I'd start talking to her about the Lord, things would just stir up in me. And I, I couldn't stand it. I just had to, and people today don't understand that why that someone begins talking about the Lord and everything, what stirs them up that they got to go and they just can't stand it. See, I was so demonized. I was so under the control of powers of darkness. And just a little bit, I was seeking with all that I could right there. Not understanding, but I always believed that there's some kind of invisible force that was destroying my life. And I didn't understand anything about it. I didn't understand about God. And my mind was just gone, practically. We married, and shortly after we married, I had a heart attack. I was taken to the hospital in a short time. I had open heart. They, they prepared me for open heart surgery. But, uh, they said I was like a, sitting on a powder cake. This was when open heart surgery was new. And as I found out later, mostly from the nurse and some of the things from the doctor, that uh, I had been on the heart and lung machine longer than anyone had ever survived it in that hospital. The surgeon finally come out to my wife right there and just leaned up against the wall. He's so weary because he couldn't sew into my arteries. I had the arteries of over a 90-year-old man from that, being an alcohol and the drugs and the destruction and everything that the powers of darkness had put me through and to my body. They left me on the operating ta table. Later, they moved me into coronary care, and my heart stopped two different times. And they called this code where they shocked the heart back, and they shocked it back. I stayed there just a few days and they sent me home. Doctors, they didn't complete the surgery and part of the surgery didn't complete wasn't even working. And I went home a dying man. And I'll tell you something else that happened in my life. I had the fear of God in my heart. I knew there was a God. I want you to know that I knew there was a hell as I'd lay there at night and I'd watch my wife go to sleep. I'd know I'd just like something you'd take and tie in a knot and I'd say, this is the night I go to hell. And you know, as I face that situation right there, each one of you will face that situation sometime. And I looked at that, I couldn't go to sleep. And I would fight sleep because I had life. You can't know, I couldn't tell you how much I wanted to live. And I, my thoughts in my mind would tell you God can't, can't uh, save you. He'll not forgive you. See, I couldn't even forgive myself because I knew I was the rottenest person that ever lived. I knew me better than anyone. I couldn't forgive myself.
I know you, you know the devil had hey, probed me to be that 220 pounds of romping, stopping hell, the steel rigger, see. This, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And I got extremely humble because I crawled around on my hands and knees with the lava running off of my chin. There isn't any tough folks. Nowhere. Nowhere. And I guess I was getting low enough to where I could listen because I've been programmed all my life not to cry. And I laid in that bed one night and tears began rolling down my face and I asked God for mercy and grace. I understand that now. I, just, I guess he just had to give me the words to just ask for mercy and grace because no one could help me outside of God and I knew it. I asked for mercy and grace and as if I want to tell you that God saved my life that night. I want to tell you when I woke up the next morning and got out of that bed, I was a brand new creation. I want to tell you that for sure. And the reason I knew it came from him because I wanted everybody else to have it. It's as if he said, zero, live. And day and night, I, I had to find a church, and, I, that's, at, and immediately I was, I was in the body of Christ, the body of Jesus, and I had to find me a church to go to. And what little I knew, of course, I knew around, look, started to look for people to kind of find out what Jesus, the thing about that is that faith, kind of like going to a big dinner, if you pick up the wrong fork, you've uh, had it. And that's what I was kind of watching to see which fork to pick up, see. But there's one thing I knew. I couldn't walk around the block. I mean, I was a dying man. I couldn't walk around the block. I couldn't stand up to take a shower. But I knew that I wanted to please Jesus. I wanted to please God with everything in my heart to realize that, they, that this world had been here for 43 years. I'd lived the life I lived and that there was a world here that I could step over just by acknowledging it and receive the grace of it and everything. was. I'd blow my mind. I can't handle it now. I want to tell you, you're listening to a testimony of grace. <laughs> I'm talking about Jesus. <laughs> I found something I could do in that church. They had a bus man. I was never heard of anything like that. I got out on that bus. I started working that bus many, many a time, folks. I'm, 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 just, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you, he put something in your heart. And I tell you, when, when he put something in your heart, the carton don't matter too much. You know it? And I stood out there and I helped those little kids on those buses and everything. I stood outside that bus and I said, this is where I die, right here. I'm going to die right here. Oh, no, it was a hot summer. And you know, I'd stand out there and I'd barely even breathe these pains and everything's in my chest. But I, you know, I determined in my heart, this is what I'd die doing. I, began, I couldn't even carry on a conversation. The brain cells and everything in my mind, the alcohol that ran on the heart and lung machine, the drugs and everything. I mean, it was kind of pitiful if you'd kind of been around me. You knew I loved Jesus, but couldn't talk. I couldn't express myself. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it all my life. I, I used to be on such inferiority that inferiority when I get around people, it would just take hot syrup and just pour it over my head right down into my shoes right there. And every time it happened, I always if I could some way I could die right now and receive it. The torment. I didn't know. See, the world, the powers of darkness program me in the world to hang in there with that. You, you just live with that. I don't have inferiority anymore. In Jesus' name. I just love to witness. I did day and night. I, you know, my, my wife, boy, she just, she just, boy, I tell you what, she just loved me. She'd wait for me to come in at night, and boy, I, I tell you what, 
I tell you what I want to find these winos and these old drunks like I was. Well, I'd tend these whosoever wills. So when I tell you what I did, I didn't know how to explain it, but boy, I was learning. I'm telling you what, I'd get around them and God do something. He'd slosh on them. He'd change their life. And the only time, the only time that I could witness. Love you, brother. Bless you, Father. Amen. I got to go. Okay, God bless you. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Bless him, Lord. <laughs> he got sloshed on. <laughs> I tell you, Jesus can do it. I just love to witness. It's the only time I could talk. Only time I could ever carry on a conversation. I just left, love to just hear myself. Boy, I wish there was somebody here to listen to this. <laughs> See, I knew it. I knew it's him. And you know, just multiplied and multiplied. Then began the light in my life. Because this is where I've been coming to to tell you. That God gave me a part. And you know the most interesting thing? And this walk with the Lord. And in His grace, folks, I'll tell you what, I'm just consumed in grace. Sometimes just a little ripple of grace comes by me and the understanding and it almost consumes me. It just always does me. I'm done in, in Jesus' name. I'm just totally done in. Just done in. I want you to know I come up here expecting to stand in it. I'm in it, folks. I'm in grace. Boy, this is where we've been. We're all in grace. I'm grace. Get in on it. I don't have one thing to boast about, obviously. There's no way you can build an image with that kind of a testimony, is there? <laughs> well, I boast in him, folks. And you know what he's saying? There come a time. Boy, I'd like to share some other thing. But there came a time that you know God, a person who couldn't talk. You know, I used to go to lay revivals. I'd go to churches all over this country to get to go out with other people and go witness there. They wouldn't call on me to give my testimony. You know why? I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk. Boy, I sure could love people of Jesus, though. And then one day, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I want you to teach this. He just, get, you know, I, I said, Lord, I'm not eloquent in speech. <laughs> I'm slow of tongue <laughs> and a mouth. And you know, say, he kind of talks to you to get your attention. He said, I'll tell you what you are. You are a new creation. Amen. Old things have passed away. All things are new. <laughs> Zero, be a teacher. <laughs> the miracle of all miracles. I'll give you a part. I use donkeys. You know, last week I told my wife, I said, Joyce, I'm convinced of anything ever was in my life that God could have that German shepherd laying right there to teach a seminar. <laughs> and I got to thinking about Sam standing up there teaching a seminar, and I got so tickled. She got tickled too. An interesting thing, it got more funny when I saw me standing up there teaching But I'm telling you what God said to me, I'm telling you, you can hear him when you're not trying to help him. That's what I liked when I was down there on the corner before I started being something. I down there cleaning carpet. Or I could just shut it off and go somewhere. 
I'm telling you what, folks, we sure do need each other. It just creeps up on you and sneaks up on you. Boy, I want you to know I love you. Can I, I just thought I'd throw that in. And God in his grace right there spoke to me. And he said, you're no longer what you've ever been. It's history. That's darkness. You have now moved out of the natural realm and you're now in the spiritual realm of my grace right now. You are a new creation. And he told me that when this word right here is what I was, I'm none of these things. I'm not living back there. Do you know that when I, when I give a testimony, I, it takes me for days that I have to go back and recall these things before I stand up and give a testimony. You can't know how difficult it is for me. That's talking about somebody else. You can't know. Because I'm going to tell you what the Lord showed me. He said, Milt, your testimony is in here. That's what you're, you are what I say you are. And he said, your testimony begins in Psalm 40. And it's all over this Bible. I keep finding my testimony. Can I tell you what my testimony is? What he, let me tell you what God said my testimony is. He lifted me up out of the pit of destruction. Out of the miry clay. He put my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to my God. Many a see and fear and trust in the Lord, and blessed is a man whose trust is the Lord and has not turned to the proud or lapsed into falsehood. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonders that thou hast done, and thy thoughts are toward me. <laughs> God, there's none to compare to thee. My ears eyes open up, and then I said, Behold, Lord, I come to thee in the scroll of the book it is written to me. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Thy law is written within my heart. Because I've been born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for me. I'm kept by the power of God through faith and through salvation ready to be revealed in a lifetime. Although I've never seen you, I love you, and although I don't see you right now, I believe you and I trust you and I rejoice with a joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving in my faith even the salvation of my soul because I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus who is without blemish, without spot. I've been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ is my cornerstone. He's a living, I'm a... He's the living stone. He's rejected a men, but chosen a God and precious, and I'm a lively stone. I'm a lively stone. It makes up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. I'm a chosen generation, a chosen person. I'm a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood, a peculiar person to show forth praises unto him who's delivered me out of the darkness. He delivered me out of the darkness. He has delivered me out of the darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom I have redemption for forgiveness of all, all, all those sins. And he took all my sins in his own body on the tree that I being dead to sin might live in the righteous by whose stripes I was healed in Jesus' name. Now who's going to harm him who follows after that which is good? Who's going to get him? I sanctify the Lord God in my heart and I'm ready to give an answer to every man that asks me with meekness and fear, casting all my cares on him because he cares for me. Jesus Christ is the exact image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation and in and through Jesus Christ all things are created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rules, authority, everything has been created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ is before all things, and in Jesus Christ all things hold together. Jesus Christ is also head of the body of the church, for he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that he should have first place in everything, for it's the Father's good pleasure that all the fullest should dwell in him. And God has reconciled me to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, and although I was formerly alienated, I was hostile in mind, I was engaged in evil deeds, Jesus Christ reconciled me to appear before him, holy, blameless, before him in love. For in Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. In Jesus Christ, I've been made complete. All my sins have blotted out and nailed the cross. In Jesus Christ, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, I promise in Jesus' name. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah to your name. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise Praise your name. Praise your name. God. God ain't reached spoken long ago, long ago through the fathers, to the prophets in many portions in many ways. In his last days it's spoken to us through his son whom he's appointed heir of all things and through whom he's made the world. He's a radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by the word of his power. And when he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And because of the great love he's loved me, he's raised me up to be with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he has chosen me before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. And he has... Praise the Lord. And he has taken every weakness, sickness, disease, infirmity, curse, and sin, and by the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm healed in Jesus' name. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places right now. Just as he had chosen me before the foundation of the world that I should be holy and blameless before him in love. That he has reconciled me in this fleshy body. Praise your name, Lord. Boy, what grace. Boy, I'm telling you. Praise your name. Oh, the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints and exceeding group. Riches of his glory to us who believe according to the working of his mighty might. Praise your name, Lord. Which he performed in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. He has placed all things under his feet and given to be the head of all things of the church, the body which I'm a part of, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The Son of God appeared for this reason. He's already destroyed the works of the devil. He's disarmed him. He made a public display of him. And, 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 and you know of Jesus and Nazareth who went about doing good, healing all those oppressed with the devil like me. And he's given me authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm me. These signs shall follow those that believe in his name. I'll cast out demons. I'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The Lord works with me. He performs... He confirms the word and signs follow. I let the high praises of God be in my mouth. A two-edged sword in my hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen, punishment on the people, to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have every saint. My weapons are mighty in God to tearing down strongholds, Amen. casting down imagination, never thought up here. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and I bring into captivity every thought into the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. My Father's word is forever settled in heaven. My Father's word is a final authority. My Father watches over his word to perform it. Heaven and earth will pass away, and my Father's word will never pass away. My Father's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. My Father's word is life to those that fight it and help to all their whole flesh. My Father's word doesn't return void. Thou accomplish what he desires, succeeding in the matter which is in it. My Father's word sanctifies me, renews my mind, separates me from the world into righteousness, and I rule and reign in life through the gift of righteousness and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. I'm more than the conqueror in Jesus' name. Grace! It's grace! Grace! It's all grace! It's all him! Never was us! God is my heavenly Father. Jesus Christ is my Lord and I'm a product of his love. I have love. I have joy. I have peace. I have long-suffering. I have goodness. 
I have gentleness, I have meekness, I have temperance, I have faith. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is the Lord Jesus in me than he that's in the world. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. As Jesus Christ is in the world, so am I. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and freedom to the prisoner, to proclaim the faithful year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and comfort those who mourn. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonders that thou hast done and thy thoughts are toward me. There's none to compare with you. My ears, thou hast opened up and then I said, Behold, Lord, I'm coming to you. And the scroll of the book, it is written to me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Thy law is written within my heart. I'm a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which is just my reasonable form of worship. I'm not conformed to this world. I'm not walk, talk, and act like this world. I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind and I'll not only know, I'll not only know, but prove what is a good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Praise, Praise your name. I rejoice greatly in my God. I rejoice greatly in my Lord. I've declared the glad tidings of thy righteousness to the great congregation. Behold, I've not restrained my lips, O oh God, thou knowest. I've, I've not hidden thy righteousness within my heart. I've spoken of thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I've not concealed thy truth. I've not concealed thy truth, Lord. I've not concealed thy truth from the great congregation. Now let those who seek the Lord rejoice and be glad in him. Let those who love thy salvation continually say, Let the Lord be magnified. For thou art a help, and you are a deliverer. I rejoice greatly in my God. My soul exalts in my God. He's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Like a bridegroom who decks himself with a garland and a bride who adorns herself with jewels. He keeps me from stumbling. He makes me stand in the glory of his presence. Holy, blameless, beyond reproach with great joy. The only wise God is my Savior. Who is Jesus Christ, my Lord, do you be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forevermore, Lord. I fight the good fight of faith. I lay hold to eternal life to which you've called me by your grace. And I make good confessions before many witnesses in the name, power, and blood of my precious, 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 oh dear Lord, I love you. Praise your name. Oh.